Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to 12080's Digital Platforms. I'm Adeline, the editor of 12080 Magazine, and I have with me today Katiana, a child psychologist from Pantai Hospital in Kuala Lumpur. So today, Katiana and I will be discussing about the effects and the impact of lewd comments that it has on children. So um, first question that I have today for Katiana is, how does hearing such lewd comments coming from adults have an impact on children? Mm. Um, nothing good, uh, ultimately, because, you know, children very much refer to adults in terms of teaching them what is acceptable uh, and what is uh, normal behavior. And so if a child um, who, mind you, we're dealing with an individual who is, from a neurological perspective, still growing, uh, something that I think adults don't realize is that the part of the human brain that uh, controls uh, emotions, uh, the ability to regulate emotions in certain situations, understanding long-term consequences, planning, everything that makes us functional adults uh, is contained in one part of the brain that will develop very slowly until you're 28 years old. So if we're looking at a child who is about 10, for example, they are 18 years from full completion or full maturation. And so when we're introducing concepts such as this, or when we are making lewd comments, um, or any type of neg negativity directed in their direction. They don't have the neurological hardware to be able to rationalize and reason and shove it away as what adults might be able to do. And so if you see a young child who's being exposed to lewd comments or being exposed to any kind of um, you know, harassment or negative interaction, you are unfortunately teaching them that these interactions are acceptable and that they are somehow uh, deserving, I think, of these comments. And that could have severe impacts on not just the way that they um, conceptualize the world and how they conceptualize relationships, because they might grow to think this is normal, this is acceptable. It is normal for me to be spoken to this way because the primary figures in my life, say parents or teachers or caregivers, have spoken to me this way. And so this is something that is acceptable. Um, it can have negative adverse effects on their sense of self-worth. Um, and when you start off life with a pretty negative framework, you increase the risk of developing things like anxiety and depression later on. So all in all, not a really good thing to happen. All right. And um, okay, so you mentioned um, the impact of it on self-worth as well. So maybe we could dive into that a little bit more. As in because mm. people, or let's just say adults, often assume that sometimes what we say in the passing, um, children mm. will not absorb them. So how early will they be able to absorb such information or what they hear from others? And, mm. and once again, maybe we could just go a bit deeper into how does it affect self-worth among children at the end of the day? Well, I mean, how, how quickly or how soon they are conceptualizing it kind of varies, I think. It uh, depends on the child's language proficiency, depends on the child's uh, experience or life experience, but ultimately a lot, a lot younger than you think. Even if children don't understand the word, the, the, the innate curiosity that comes with kids will often result in them asking other people what that word means. Or even if they're, you know, most kids are now very savvy with the internet, looking up things if they know how it's spelled. So it is generally not a good thing because I think that if I implore all adults who tune into this to, who argue that, oh, we don't recognize it, right? Think about that one negative comment that you've heard from your parents, right? And whether or not you can still remember it, and I'm sure you can. We've all been on the receiving end of some negative comments, which even if we couldn't fully appreciate, we still remember till today. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, these comments are being thrown towards young children, again, like you said, because parents or adults think that they don't recognize it, right? Um, but that's completely untrue. So yes, if you were to say a curse word or make a derogatory comment to a two-year-old, they might not be able to understand what that's like, but they can read body language. Mm -hmm. So if you are presenting aggressive body language, for example, or you are laughing at their expense, or you are you know, pinching the folds above their diaper and things like that, those are things that they can process, non-verbal cues, if you will. So 
I would say they start as early as you think, right? And I would not like to take the risk of saying, oh, I can still call them things at four, but at five, I'll stop, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a little bit too risky um, an approach to take. Um, And going back to your second question about self-worth, because, you know, a child's primary environment when they come into this world is their parents and their family. And that circle will expand as they go to school. It will include the school environment and friends. And then when they become teenagers, it will grow even further. But no matter how you spin it, the primary environment is the family. And so when your starting point, when your primary environment is already the source of a lot of discrimination and a lot of these comments, Children or any individual will grow up thinking, well, if the people who brought me into this world, the people who are supposed to love me unconditionally, already have these comments about me, what more strangers? What more the world outside these doors, right? So I have seen evidence of uh, these self-worth or self-confidence issues affecting people to adulthood where young girls are going into abusive relationships because they started off in life constantly being made fun of and that resulted in them feeling like they're not worth very much that they have to constantly earn the love and affection of those around them right and that is how love is achieved by fighting for it by proving your worth and that allows them to get into really nasty relationships growing up because they weren't encouraged in that way. So I would say that it changes your value because unfortunately, parents teach you what your value is very early on, right? And so if you're starting off already making fun of them, passing lewd comments, cussing at them, doing all of these things, you are essentially communicating to them that their value straight out the gate is not very much. Mm. So how they respond to that moving forward can happen in a lot of different ways. Either you see option one, girls constantly feeling insecure and anxious, uh, even boys, sorry, not just the girls, but feeling very, very unsettled and needing to, to earn that affection, earn that validation, earn that respect. And that can come from having very dysfunctional professional and personal relationships, right, moving forward. And then you have the flip side where you have children growing up holding a lot of resentment when they realize that this is where it's coming from. And you see dissolutions of families coming forward from that, right? So ultimately it's never a good thing. I often tell parents or I tell adults, what do you gain exactly from doing that to a person who can't fight back, right? That says more about you than it does about them because they're not in a position to be able to argue with you. They're not in a position to be able to defend themselves. So ultimately, it's, a, it's an act of bullying, mm-hmm. right? So it's something that I think a lot of parents need to be very mindful of. Okay. All right. And um, okay, referring to a recent case that we had in our country where a teacher made a comment, a lewd comment about um, yeah. the, the um, you know, raping, about raping in yeah. other words. Yeah. So, um, yeah. and uh, the effect that the classroom had was that the teacher and the boys were laughing as said by a student. So I was wondering as well, I mean, such comments, what can the impact be of, say, in this case, boys towards the opposite sex and how, how they mm. view and respect the opposite mm. sex? I mean, that, that, that whole thing was plain as day. I mean, he was making a comment. He was a person in authority. He was an adult. He was someone they looked up to. Um, He was basically through his actions giving them permission, right? And even if it was a joke, uh, the fact that it was allowed to to continue to the extent where the boys were encouraged and and, and, um, egged on to laugh, right, means that on top of that, this person had given these boys the awareness that their behavior was acceptable, that them making derogatory comments about girls is acceptable, you can get away with it with no recourse, right? Mm -hmm. There was so much horrible messaging in what he did. Um, And the fact that he was able to brush it off and say, oh, it's a joke. That is the fundamental problem with Mm -hmm. all of this stuff, Mm -hmm. right? Because 
whenever a, a girl or even even you know even a, a boy who has ever come forward on the heels of being harassed it is always something that people will brush off and say well it was a joke and therefore you shouldn't get upset and that narrative is the problem but i think when you give it to the hands of authority figures it becomes so damaging because these kids are kids and yeah. they are uh, they are learning about the adult world through how we conduct ourselves as adults and so this person in authority had just taught them a very very bad lesson which is that the girls are sub the girls are subpar right the girls are somehow of a lower stature to them uh, that these comments are acceptable and worse more, you know even worse was that that rape is acceptable mm -hmm. right because his comment was rape those who are legal Right, mm -hmm. so rape is somehow conditional, right? Um, and it's just mind-boggling that you know that this was that this had actually happened, and, and bless um, Ayn for coming forward and speaking up about it. But it is just a snapshot into how damaging this can be because um, not a lot of girls in her position would stand up because of this person's right. authority. Yeah. So it is you know, it, it is really, really dangerous when things like this happen because you're teaching men, right? Young men, yeah. what is right and what is wrong. And yeah. in this particular lesson, it was that making fun of girls is right. Joking about rape is right. That rape is acceptable under certain conditions. These were all things that he had taught. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's why it's so dangerous because of the position that you're in. Mm -hmm. All right. And you know, it depends like, um, like you said, we're blessed that I was able to speak up about this, you know, and to know that, that what the teacher said was not the right comment at all. But like you said, mm -hmm. some students may not, um, you know, may not have the courage to speak up. But um, how, how can the, in other words, how does parents play a role in mm -hmm. sort of um, helping with the impact of such comments? Because as you said, mm -hmm. the um, at the end of the day, it boils down to family, it boils down to the yeah. primary core of, you know, of family yeah. at the end of the day. So yeah. how, how does that um, foundation help with filtering or at least kind of helping with how people as, um, react to such comments and understanding them? Mm. Mm. Put your foot down and accept that this is not acceptable, right? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that parents play such a powerful role in, yeah. in addressing things like this. Can they go and stop the teacher from saying that in the moment? No, I understand that they're not there. They can't do that. But they are able to address the situation after it has happened. When the girl comes home and tells the parents this, this is where the parents have to stand up for them. And the parents need to reassure and reaffirm the fact that this was a not was entirely inappropriate, right? And not at all acceptable for someone on the school's level to have to do. And I implore parents to take it a step further and make some noise, mm -hmm. right? Show your kids that this is not acceptable because the other thing is that your silence is also support. Yeah. And so if you tell your kids, oh, um, yeah, just biya just let it go. You are teaching your girls to acquiesce. You're teaching your girls to accept that this is okay just because you don't want to rock the boat. And I understand that that's a big fear for parents, right? Wanting to confront institutions when it comes to this and I'm not saying go and file a lawsuit or do anything major but ultimately your children are going to look to you on how to react and if you are going to sit silent if you're not going to sit your child down and go look I am so sorry that you had to listen to that and I want you to understand that what he said does not reflect how the world works and it doesn't reflect how we feel, especially if there's a father there, how I feel as a man, right? And it is unacceptable that he made you feel in that moment that you were inadequate. And I hope that you would remember, if nothing at all, that the rest of the world doesn't feel this way. And just because one person, an important person, told you that it was that way, that it's not the reflection of the rest of the world, mm -hmm. right? And then take it a step further and take it with the school, hold these people accountable because then we are teaching our generation to fight for what is right. And I think that, you know, girls like Ayn are, are, are people to look up to yeah. because they are showing us the power of saying enough, the power of saying like, this is not, this is not acceptable. So, you know, 
parents sometimes feel that like, oh, if I just like diffuse the situation, everything will be okay. But diffusing is again, it's a questing. So I would say to parents, no, you can't stop it from happening, right? But what you can do is pick it up when it does. So if your child comes to you with these reports, sit them down and have them understand that it is not at all acceptable and not at all the truth. Deal with the repercussions as it comes. Do not brush it under the carpet. Do not tell your child to just be okay with it or ignore it, right? Work with your child, have your child confide in you, answer your child's questions, and then complain to the school, make the school accountable, make the teachers accountable. Whether or not it goes beyond that is irrelevant. It's about the mere action of showing your child to stand up for what is right. I think there's so much power in that. So yeah, don't stay silent. That's what I'm saying to parents now. Okay, nice. And you know, it's also about um, having the kids opening up to parents. I think this part plays a very important role in how the relationship, uh, the parent-child relationship is. So could you perhaps um, share a little bit about that and how parents can cultivate a healthy relationship with their child? Like in Ayn's case, her dad listened to her and, mm. and of course they followed report and everything. So, so make, in some cases, parents might be like, it's my child saying the truth, telling the truth, you know, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. Or some, some yeah. children might even feel scared about voicing such a thing out because they yeah. are afraid that they'll be judged. So how can parents cultivate such a healthy parent-child relationship that they know that I'm, the child will be able to know I, it's okay for me to tell the truth. And as parents, yeah. you will be able to hear your child well enough and act according to what is right. You know, kids are programmed to think that their parents are rock stars and superheroes, right? They're, they're programmed to think that their parents are the best thing on earth. And when you have a child who starts withdrawing from their parents or feeling like they can't trust their parents or speak to their parents, it's because there were probably incidences where they needed to speak up, where their conversation or their comments or their request was not met with the response they needed, right? So either, and I think it's it's not uncommon nowadays, parents are often very busy, uh, parents are often not always available, there's always a screen separating children from their parents. Um, and, you know, and, and more severely, sometimes when kids come to their parents with things that are important to them, something that we as adults might find trivial, like, oh, my friend doesn't want to be my friend anymore, or um, my friend uh, Rajo doesn't want to talk to me today, or something like that. As adults, it is not a big issue. But, and because of that, we tend to diminish or invalidate that experience in our kids where we go, I have a teacher, or we'll be like, just forget about it. It's not that big a deal. Tomorrow they'll like you again. We diminish the experience because we have decades of experience above them. And we realize that a friend not wanting to talk to you today is not the end of the world. But for a child at that age, where it might be, right? And so the first thing I tell parents is, do your best not to invalidate your kid's experience, even if you don't really understand where they're coming from, right? Even if your child is distraught because he lost his favorite Lego, right? Don't diminish that, you know? So that is where we can encourage healthy communication with our kids. When our kids know that no matter what we, they bring to us, we will always be ready. We will always be willing, right? Um, and yes, we can teach them. We can always go, yeah, but you know, sometimes our friends have bad days and they don't really want to talk to this and that's okay. You can do that, right? But you are still giving them the opportunity to voice their concerns. Now, like we talked about the lewd comments, there is no clear delineation of what year kids will all of a sudden decide they don't want to talk to you anymore. It is a gradual process. So, especially in this day and age with so many things going on, we need to be able to have open communication with our children. So say you have a child who is still quite young and you want to foster that communication, then do what I said in the sense where encourage open communication as much as possible. If your child comes to you with a matter, no matter how trivial, put the phone away, close the laptop if you can. If you're busy, tell them, okay, mommy's just going to send this one email, give me five minutes and I'll be right with you and stick to that, right? So show your child that you are engaged and invested even though you've got other things going on, right? But if let's just say the bridge has been a little burnt and your child is not really very open with you anymore, then what I would suggest is to show a hand of vulnerability. So part of the reason why the child is withdrawing is because they have developed a schema in their head that 
mom and dad don't really think what I have to say matters or mom and dad don't really understand what I'm going through. A very common teen comment, I believe. Mom and dad don't really understand what I'm going through. And so showing them a hand of vulnerability shows them that you do actually, right? So something would be like, bringing up the topic of what Ayn had been doing, right? So going up to your child and be like, hey, so I just kind of want to check in and see if there's anything going on at school. And if your child stonewalls you and says, no, everything's fine. Go back and say, okay, well, you know, I was kind of online and I saw this, this viral video that Ayn had posted about what was happening at school. And it really kind of made me think about my own school experience and how there were things going on with teachers that really upset me and I had nowhere to go. So I want you to understand that you've always got me whenever you feel like it. And then leave it, at that, leave it at that. When I say you're showing a hand of vulnerability, you're showing your children that you are not this all-knowing, all-right, all-unaffected force in their life, which is something I think parents think they have to portray with kids. It's something I do in sessions. I show my teens constantly that I have experience in what they're going through. Um, I all, and, you know, and, and leaving that little breadcrumb and saying, you know, I'm always here if you want to chat, I get it, you know, and then walking away doesn't mean that the door is closed. The child just kind of needs to know that you're there, right? And so the next time just be like, yeah, you know, I was reading up about the amount of response that people have been giving about Ayn and it made me think that there are so many people who kind of are affected by this, you know, and it really is quite sad that they didn't feel that they could come forward before. They didn't have the support that they needed, you know? another breadcrumb on the floor, right? So there are always these opportunities, but kids, especially teenagers, need to feel safe. Like you said, they need to know that they're not going to be judged. They need to know that they're not going to be prosecuted or invalidated. And these are ways that you can show them that you can be open and that you won't be doing all of those things. But they need not jump and be like, okay, well, this is the problem. You might not get that kind of uh, response uh, first, first try. But just giving them these opportunities is already a really good way to remedy that. Mm. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katiana, for filling us in about that. Um, one last question from us, which is, could you just maybe share with us one last message from your end about this situation and how parents as well as children um, can empower each other to stop such comments from being passed on in the future? It starts with us, right? It starts with adults. It starts with parents. It starts with teachers. It starts with government. It starts with all the people who are running this country and who are running the future generation because one day we're going to leave it to them, right? And what you teach them now will develop into what or the people they become growing up, right? So what kind of adult do you want to leave this world to, right? And so if you are not being mindful of the actions and the words and the things you're saying, especially when you have been given the privilege of authority, you, you know, then you are condemning the future to a generation that doesn't have any sense of loyalty, that doesn't have any sense of uh, self-worth, right? Um, and, and that's a horrible thing. So, you know, if you can't even think that far, do unto others. How would you feel being on the receiving end of all of this treatment and whether you would consider it acceptable for yourself? Mm -hmm. You know, I think people need to be a lot more empathetic um, and people need to be a lot more aware. But, you know, I feel that if, I, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I've said this repeatedly, we keep putting the burden of this on children. Yeah. You know, I am so proud of Ayn for what she did, but at the same time, I'm devastated that it took her to have to bring attention to this because ultimately she is a child. And it just makes me super disappointed in the adult community for the fact that we were not able to, to be the ones to show yeah. that th this generation is not acceptable. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I I'm proud that she was able to, and I'm proud that we have created, you know, uh, that some parents have created a generation of teens who are very outspoken. Um, and, and that gives me hope for humanity. But I think that, you know, it does start with us because she makes, she can make as much noise as she wants, but mm -hmm. if the adults around her don't see the validity and who will not fight the fight with her, it doesn't get very far. That's the unfortunate reality of the way the world works. So, it starts with you. That's the main thing. And if you don't think it's acceptable, do something about it, right? And that's the only way it can get very far because if you don't, you're leaving it to the kids to sort it out. So, yeah. <laughs> very true. Very true. Thank you so much, Katina. Like you you're said, welcome. 
it starts with us and always put ourselves in the shoes of the other person. If you don't want it to happen to us, why should it happen to somebody else, right? Yes, so, absolutely. All right. all right then, thank you so much for your time today. Um, that's the end of our session. So thank you again and have a wonderful afternoon.